Thank you, Ann. Thank you very much. I've just had a wonderful welcome here. It's been uh, since 1983, uh, since I was in Denmark, so I really appreciate the welcome. And believe it or not, I actually had to come from Southern California to Denmark in March to get better weather. It was snowing when, my, when I left my house. Now, we live up in the mountains, so that's understandable. But it's been a wonderful trip so far, and I hope to reciprocate by sharing with you my experiences from a very different and somewhat unique experience background, having flown in space, yet at the same time as a leader in that venture and as a space shuttle mission commander, having faced many very, very similar challenges to what you and the operational folks out on the rigs and, and that are getting the job done every day have to face. Uh, I am so totally impressed with how similar the oil and gas industry, particularly offshore exploration, is uh, to space exploration. Uh, it, not so much in the vehicle itself, that's your finely tuned Swiss watch, but on the launch pads, the, the scale, the scope, the size, very, very similar. So I see a lot of connections between our industries, the approach to doing business. We are all definitely in 99.9999% operations where we must be high reliability because we're dealing with uh, some of the riskiest and most inherently dangerous operational environments on the planet or, in my case, off the planet. So what I want to do to, with you today is uh, share some of the lessons learned from the, that unique background, keeping in mind that at the end of the day, we all are facing the same or si at least similar challenges. Also, uh, from a context viewpoint, I view all of this uh, essentially as a leadership and a teamwork challenge. The people side of the equation to pull it all together and to uh, con conduct these operations in a safe and effective manner. So before I get into the meat of my presentation, I do want to lay an umbrella over everything, kind of an, a philosophy for the talk that comes from Dr. Robert Goddard, this gentleman here on the left. Uh, he was the inventor of the liquid-fueled rocket engine, and back in the 20s, uh, as he was exploring this technology and as a very technical guy doing technical stuff, he also had a very long-range vision. It's very clear from his, some of his writings that he understood that at some point in the future, this technology would take humans outside the atmosphere and, and expand our ability to explore the universe that's out there. Uh, he said once, uh, in response to some of the naysayers who thought he was just a crazy guy blowing up rockets, or these little devices that no one understood. He said, who is to say what is impossible? For the dreams of yesterday are the hopes of today and the realities of tomorrow. And I love that combination of the long-range vision and understanding that you're working on something that hundreds and hundreds of years from now will have a continuing impact on the human species, yet at the same time being a technical guy, rolling up your sleeves, doing the hard work to make it happen. So I'd like that to kind of inform everything I talk about today, particularly in light of this in incredibly aggressive and challenging go goal of zero, taking the incidents and the accidents and the bad things down to absolutely nothing. And I'll talk about uh, some of the, the things I've learned through my experience in, in a very similar sort of philosophical background in the space program uh, to, sh to share with you. Now, before I get into the meat of the presentation, though, I do need to bring us all up to the same uh, point of understanding, essentially, on what it's really like for humans to fly in space. It is a very, very different operational uh, environment with weightlessness and so forth. It's, uh, at the same time, uh, somewhat terrifying as exhilarating and exciting and the most fun thing you could ever imagine. So I'm going to show about a three-minute movie clip of uh, the mission I commanded, STS-90, which flew in 1998. It was a life science research flight, so very focused. They had four uh, real smart docs on board that did the payload work. And this is just going to be a quick executive summary of that mission uh, to kind of give me a chance to explain to you some of the sensations, the human side of humans, human spaceflight. So as long as uh, Mr. Apple's working there, yes, we'll go get the movie going. As I mentioned, it flew in uh, April of 1998. It was the last of 25 Space Lab missions. Uh, the Space Lab module was uh, designed, uh, constructed by the European Space Agency contributing to the program. Flew 25 flights on board the shuttle, and this was the culmination of that program, the last flight. Of course, we had to do our commute to work first. First, It's a very short commute, only eight and a half minutes, but it's a very rough ride for the first couple of minutes. As the solid rocket boosters burn, there's a lot of... Uh, 
shaking back and forth, and it's difficult to read the gauges, and you really know you're going someplace in a hurry, you know. But then those solid rocket boosters drop off, as you see here, and they don't just drop off. They're blown off the side, side firing rocket motors, sounds like cannons going off in the cockpit. And then the rest of the ride is very smooth the rest of the way to orbit. At the end, when main engines uh, stop, you seats move forward like you saw in the video. You enter an entirely different world. Uh, you go from being the, the rocket pilot into being an orbiting space person, and in our case, having to prepare the laboratory facilities to get to work and to do the research. This is the back of the Space Lab module as it's being opened up. A couple of our astronauts are heading back there to get things started. And this is generally what it looked like uh, as things were busy and uh, moving forward in the mission. I don't really have time to talk about the science and what we did on board, but I thought you might appreciate seeing one of our little crewmates. This is a rat that flew on board. Look in the upper left-hand corner there as he kind of goes flipping. Yeah. <laughs> He gets off, off task there a little bit and goes flipping off. Of course, we flew seven large primates on board as well. That, those were the humans on board. We were part of the experiments. And we just had to live up there as well as doing our work. So things like hygiene with this rinseless shampoo, a little bit of playtime each day, not much, but you do get the chance to enjoy the weightlessness on occasion like I was flipping K higher end over in there. Uh, meal times are a magnificent part of the experience. It's really the only time the evening meal, the whole crew can get together, talk about how the day's uh, gone, look out the window at things like the Straits of Gibraltar you see there, and it really just makes a wonderful bonding time for the crew. And I found it, as a leader, a very valuable time as well to assess how the day had gone, to you know, kind of build up for the next day and kind of uh, collect our energies for what was to come. Uh, it all ends all too quickly. This was a 16-day flight, which was the third longest shuttle mission we've ever flown. Uh, but even with that, it just seemed like it was over in a heartbeat. Uh, it was time to sh change our mode of thinking again, get back into the test pilot mode, hop into that front left seat of the shuttle and fly it back and rely on all that incredible amount of training that I had had to prepare for that with the assistance of my co-pilot, Scott Altman, bring Columbia back, uh, land it there in Florida at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, this was the end of a uh, six and a half million mile journey, 256 times around the earth in that 16 day period. Uh, this is a view later in the evening. Uh, we had about eight hours of medical post-flight tests after the, after the landing before we could come out and begin to savor this joint experience we'd had as a crew and look at Columbia and, and appreciate the fact that we were safe and sound back on the earth. So that's, in essence, uh, you know, just a nutshell, just the tip of the iceberg of what the experience is about. Uh, and now let's kind of plunge off into our flight plan here. If we take a look at the, uh, the one and only slide that we're going to have in my presentation with any substantial number of words on it. I use what I call pilot-friendly PowerPoint. <laughs> Lots of images and video and, and, of course, stories and examples to make, make the point. But I do think it's very important for me to lay out my organizational framework for you and kind of where I'm headed with this talk and what things I think are most important for me to share with you. I have something I call a 4P peak performance balance. And uh, easy to remember, everything begins with the same letter. We pilots like stuff like that. Uh, but it starts with purpose, that sense of mission. What are we all about? You know, big picture. Uh, then to program, which is the tactical day-to-day -day execution. And my focus today will actually be on that. I think it's most relevant for a safety conference and some of those operational excellence kind of principles I've learned. So I'll, I'll dwell on that a little bit more than the others. Of course, people, are, are, they're who make it all happen. And leadership and teamwork is essentially about people. At the end of the day, it's really the most important of any of these principles or categories because they can make up for shortfalls in the other areas. And surrounding all of that is perspective, and I'll try to offer a little bit of, uh, I think, fairly unique perspective having been uh, a flyer in space and share with you some of my thoughts on that to uh, wrap the talk up at, at the end. So if everyone's happy with that flight plan, we'll, we'll launch off into the meat of things here. Way back in 1961, President Kennedy set the course for the United States to attempt this incredibly crazy and wild aspiration to go to the moon and return safely again in the course of less than a decade. And as he did this, he not only set out the goal, but he, in a very eloquent sort of way, he laid forth some of the rationale for it. And to paraphrase a little bit, he said, we, we choose to do these things not because they are easy, but because they are hard. And I believe there's tremendous power in choosing to do very difficult things and knowingly going into uh, choosing the most challenging path that you can because by doing that, 
you accomplish so much more than if you just muddle along. Uh, it has informed my life. It's been kind of a philosophy I grew up with and have applied uh, ever since. And I found it was very necessary when I, on a personal basis, was selected for the astronaut corps and was challenged to, to the limits of my ability to prepare and to do this very, very challenging thing. Human spaceflight is supremely challenging as a venture, and I found it supre supremely challenging for me to do everything that was required of me to prepare to go fly in space. I don't think it's substantially any different from what you are choosing to do in the oil and gas industry, and, and by the way, many other industries and ventures around the, the world, uh, you know, aviation, of course, very much into it, the, the medical community, trying to drive uh, the sources of error and problems and the, and the human factors down to the minimum, minimum level to really go for this, uh, you know, zero tolerance for the incidents and accidents. That is choosing the hard. I commend you for that, uh, for those aspirations, and uh, I say that that provides the courage to get out to the launch pad and keeps you going day to day. Uh, the the other, only other element I'm really going to uh, dwell on or focus on in this first bit about purpose is the fact that as you perceive what you do is a mission that matters, or in my definition, uh, service to others, uh, you gather so much more power and you fuel yourself and your team for the long run. You, t you saw a little bit more space video there and I want you to notice and remark that there were no launch or landing clips in this little section here. It was all about the job that astronauts really are paid to do. Astronauts and cosmonauts uh, we don't go to space just for the fun ride on the way up. I mean, it is enjoyable as long as you can keep in the back of your mind that you might die during the ride. But other than that, it's very enjoyable. But once you get there, that's where the value added comes. That's where the work that is done that really makes a difference. Now, on this particular mission, I was, it was so gratifying to fly a flight that was de dealing with fundamental, basic life sciences research and how these si living systems operate in the absence of gravity that has, in addition to paving the way downstream for astronauts to stay in space longer, also potential clinical applications down here on the Earth. And again, I don't have time to talk about the specifics, but suffice it to say that um, I could get up and look at myself in the mirror every, every morning and say, wow, I'm part of something that's so much greater than myself that's really making a difference that is a mission that matters. Absolutely, every one of you fit in that category as well. You know, working in the HSE field specifically and, and with any role in driving the incidents and accidents down in your industry and making it where everyone comes off that rig every time and gets back home safely is truly a mission that matters. Well, one, uh, I've got a couple case studies. I call them case studies, but in reality, it's just an excuse to show you a rocket video. So this is the first one. How many of you, by a show of hands, have heard of the X Prize, uh, the Ansari X Prize? I see a few. The rest of you might remember a, a 19 or 2004, fall of 2004, a little tiny rocket ship out in the desert in California, went to the edge of space, did it twice within two weeks. Well, that was to win this $10 million Ansari X Prize. And that's the video, of course, that you're seeing some of right here. Uh, it was an incredible project. I was very privileged to be the chief judge for this venture. Now, we go back a few years prior to that, and I was still in the astronaut corps in 1997 when I first learned about this, uh, this proposal, this prize, and I just laughed it off. I read about it in Space News, one of our industry uh, uh, periodicals, and I said, no way. I mean, this stuff, is, it takes billions of dollars, not millions, and it's, a, it's the purview of big government projects, and I just don't see how it could ever be done privately. And thank goodness I was wrong. And thank goodness also when I left the astronaut corps, I got connected with some very visionary people, Peter Diamandis, who's the founder of the X Prize. I worked with them on some other projects, and they invited me in to put a team together to verify the technical accomplishments of, uh, of uh, this particular project. And it is a great, great example of the power of purpose. Everyone from Dr. Diamandis and that was involved in the project, whether the foundation or the team that, that actually constructed the vehicle and flew it and so forth, everyone had this long-range view and this sense of purpose that, hey, we're going to choose to do something very, very difficult and hard. We believe it really matters. We believe expansion of, you know, all these space geeks believe the expansion of the human species off the planet is an important thing long-term. And the power of that purpose 
drove this project in a way that they did something that had never been done before. And it has completely turned my industry on its head in the sense, or at least a segment of indus industry that deals with, you know, putting humans in space and so forth. And we look at it in a very different way than we did six years ago. And it's moved on to commercialization projects. Uh, you see the Virgin logo on there uh, on the Spaceship One. Well, that's been commercialized, Virgin Galactic. A little company I work with is involved with it. I'll show you a little bit about them later. And it just emphasizes the power of purpose. Well, let's get into the meat of the, of the program with program. Uh, I'm not going to offer a lot of abbreviations or acronyms. I know we've had a few, and you always run a risk when someone from NASA comes and, and talks. We have so many acronyms in, in NASA that we have acronyms for acronyms. Do you ha I'm sure you have things like that in the oil industry as well. Uh, but, the only, but I will offer this one to you without apology, and it is PAPA. It stands for Preparation, Awareness, Persistence, and Accountability. And it's just my way of organizing in my mind. Anytime I'm, I'm involved with a new venture or go into a new operation, need to uh, help build the team or exercise some leadership, how I categorize the various elements and how they need to play together and work in a feedback loop to keep the team getting better and better. So we'll start off with um, one or two examples of each and then a couple little case studies at the very end. You know, preparation provides the sure foundation, and it needs to be done on an individual level, on a small team level, all the way up in a systemic, to a systemic level, even at the, at the huge multinational corporation level, like a, like a Shell or one of the very largest oil companies. And this philosophy or approach that we can never be too prepared uh, it provides that foundation. Now, one of the privileges I found of being involved in training for space flight is they, we leave no stone unturned in getting the humans that are going to fly the spaceships ready to do that. By the time I actually landed Columbia and they had given me the keys to this $2 billion national asset, um, I had flown some 1,200 shuttle trainer approaches in this modified Grumman uh, Gulfstream business jet. And on each and every one of these ap approaches, you critique far more things than I had ever done in any flight training I'd ever had in the military or civilian. And you just wring out every bit of uh, information and lesson learned you can from every single one of those operations to, over a period of years to finally be ready. Uh, that preparation uh, stand, stood me in, in good stead uh, in everything that I did on my missions. And, and that's what built the cohesive teams, knowing that when you looked at each other in the, uh, in the eye, when you're ready to go fly, that we're as prepared as we can humanly be. I'm going to address this uh, in just a couple minutes with another story that's a, a little more dramatic about that. Uh, but let's go through each of the elements first. Um, awareness, and I like to put the word situational in front of it. It's an, <clears throat> a term that began primarily in aviation, but has expanded to so many other industries. And there's a variety of... Uh, of definitions you can apply to that, some more academic than others, some more detailed than others, but I'm going to give you the basic fighter pilot version of it, that situational awareness is really nothing more complex than just knowing what's going on around you and all of the ramifications of that so you can then take the appropriate action. And I thought it was just uh, wonderful in Nicola's talk where she addressed that, you know, you have to be brutally honest with where you and your organization is, what the situation uh, is as it exists, not what you would like it to be, and situational awareness in, in your setting and context is hugely dependent on that. Um, <clears throat> it's an important individual aspect in my career field for, for pilots. It's an absolute must uh, with the very complex missions and so forth, uh, but also on an organizational basis. Uh, there are certain approaches you can take to build the overall situational awareness of the group. I included this particular picture of an aircraft, not so much about the aircraft. It's a very unique test aircraft I had the chance to, to fly when I was a NASA research test pilot, but because of what was behind that. You know, this vehicle as a test research vehicle, there's so much information coming in, sensors and so forth, there's absolutely no way the two-person crew on board could incorporate all that and record it and take it. So we had uh, so much telemetry that went down to the ground and, and set up with a control center that's much like uh, we use with the space program to expand and leverage that situational awareness. I would like you to think of opportunities you have in, in your particular 
job and situation with your companies and organizations, how you can leverage and expand that situational awareness. Do whatever you can, and I can't give you specifics on that, obviously, but uh, to think of what you can do to open the blinders uh, in everyone that's involved with the operation, from the, the newest new hire out on a rig to the most senior executive, and, and apply the principles to uh, get to that point where that situational awareness is continually boosted. Uh, next element, of course, is persistent, and uh, this is uh, the opposite of complacency when you get right down to it. It's, uh, it's this attitude that uh, it's never just good enough, that no matter how hard we work, how successful we've been, tomorrow may be the bad day, and we need to put that off yet another day, like again was addressed this morning. Um, so a little bit of, I, I thought it would be fun to include a, an image of out on the launch pad, because this is very much like an oil rig. First. Well, I've, I've made one visit to an offshore rig, the DD-1, which is out in the Gulf of Mexico, and I got off the helicopter and said, hey, I'm home. This is just like launch pad 39B, where I launched into space three times and where I'd spent a lot of time working on various projects. Well, we go through at the, the, one of the very last exercises we go through before launch, it's just a week or so before launch, the entire crew goes down to Florida. We do a full end-to-end -end dress rehearsal of the countdown, and then we simulate an emergency and, and a, doing an emergency egress and hop into these slide wire baskets. And, uh, and so it's, it's a very persistent kind of approach to the training with all the details. But there's another element of persistence I want to mention on this that I think bears some similarities to situations or trade-offs that you might have to make. See, this slide wire basket, it's certified to carry humans in it. And uh, it's, if things are really going bad on the pad and, you know, the whole hydrogen-oxygen mix, mix out there is about to blow up or whatever, they could put the crew in these baskets, you slap a paddle switch that uh, cuts a guillotine, and you take this ride to go about 100 kilometers an hour down this slide wire, you get to the bottom, you dive into a bunker, and then, so they say, that would withstand those uh, 500,000 pounds of uh, liquid propellants plus couple million pounds of uh, solid propellants all blowing up at once, you know. So that's the scenario. Well, when they went to certify this, uh, the plan was following some appropriate risk management kind of guidelines. They said, well, we really don't want to put humans in it just for a test. We'll put the sandbags, and that's a close enough simulation. Well, Charlie Bolden, who's now the administrator of NASA, he was over this project from the astronaut office point of view, and he says, no, we must and he was very persistent in this against the system. This is where it ties into the persistence part. We must absolutely test it in, the, in a like manner that it would be op operated by because the dynamics of humans moving around might affect it a little bit. So we, we have to at least have humans ride at once. So after much persistence and pushing back and making these trade-offs, you know, the risk-risk trade-offs, um, they got it approved. He wrote it down with a couple of the Kennedy Space Center fire personnel, uh, fully certified it's in operation. But it's that kind of approach and constantly knocking at the door and constantly saying, you know, it's not good enough. We can make the operation better that's required at every level in your organizations. Um, again, right from the newest new hire all the way up to the CEO. Last element, accountability. I included for this, I often use uh, for my business presentations a different image for this accountability, but I chose this one for this group because we live and work in an instant accountability environment. In other words, uh, it's very similar to flying close formation in a fast jet. I mean, you're just a, a few meters away, and uh, you're not too far away if you screw something up of you know, having a really, really bad day. So you have instant accountability. If that happens, you know that you really have your bad day and you've really screwed up. Uh, the same thing obviously happens out on the rigs by the people doing the operations. They can, in a heartbeat, things can change, and they have their, they come face to face with their own mortality and the accountability of, uh, of things not working right or or a, an incident happening. Uh, to avoid that, kind of my rule of thumb is to avoid these terrible ramifications of instant accountability in these very dynamic operational settings. We must hold ourselves to even ever higher levels of accountability and debriefing and seriously taking lessons learned on board uh, to keep pushing back those kinds of events. So it's kind of an interesting, to me, kind of an interesting uh, contrast between avoiding the, the bad instant accountability by having the willingness to be accountability in the comfort of the conference room as you discuss how you're going to make things better, for example. Okay, let's... Uh, I have a couple quick examples. The first one is, uh, this is a shuttle reentry. 
Arguably, you might say it's the most critical shuttle reentry we've ever done because it's the only one that's ever come back on two of the three hydraulic systems on board the shuttle. Uh, I was the pilot on the flight, so the hydraulics were my system. I was managing them uh, differently because of this uh, malfunction we'd had. And the malfunction itself, although I don't have video of that, actually happened on, on launch. And so here's the situation. And try to put yourself in a similar situation. You know, you're, you're driving along in the car, but... Uh, Unlike in the car, I can't just get off at the exit and stop, you know. And you have something really bad go on, and how do you deal with it? So I'm 30 seconds away from main engine cutoff, and uh, simultaneously with the ground calling up, I, the alarms go off in the cockpit, and I see the, the flashing information that we've got a hydraulic leak, and ground goes, you know, uh, Atlantis, Houston, PLT, that was me, the pilot, uh, hydraulic leak system two, uh, do the leak procedure. I verified with the data, told the commander I would do the initial steps and we would do the rest after main engine cutoff by, by now about 20 seconds away. Stepped right into it and, you know, in retrospect, I was calm as, as just relaxing on my back porch on a summer day. I just reached down, you know, did the procedure. I had it fully memorized, but I still had the checklist out in front of me. Stepped right through it. It wasn't until afterwards when we got to the cleanup steps and main engine cutoff that I really thought, like, wow, this was not in the simulator today. This was not just kind of in my shirt sleeves and no big deal. If I would have reached like two centimeters over either direction and grabbed the wrong switch, uh, I would not be here to talk to you today. Uh, but the reason why I was able to get to that was that level of preparation and the awareness that they build us to through, I mean, some long, long hours of preparation and, and training and continually studying and, and preparing, getting ready, that enabled me to do that. And I'm very, very grateful for that training at the, at the end of the day that I uh, had that background and was able to do that. Uh, the other story, so that pretty much focused on the, the first P and first A of my acronym, Preparation Awareness. Uh, the next little story is going to focus a little bit more on the persistence and accountability side. And it's, uh, it's my sort of, but much, much less dramatic, uh, Apollo 13 story. Uh, of course, Apollo 13, most of you are familiar with an incredible explosion on the way to the moon, and they dealt with this, I mean, NASA's shining hour. In fact, uh, some very senior NASA people have said that it was more profound, more showed the, the, the best of NASA bringing the crew home safely from this than any of the moon landings. So it's at that level. Um, so this is much less dramatic, but it was still a life support system challenge that we had. We had a system on board that removed carbon dioxide from the air. And uh, I was up on the flight deck w one day mid-mission, and my flight engineer, Kay Heyer, who you saw in the movie, came, floated upstairs and said, Rick, I just heard a really weird noise, a clunk kind of sound, and then a grinding sound from the, under the mid-deck floor where the RCRS is. And I'm like, oh. So I pulled up the data. It was acting funny. It was a signature I had not seen that we had not really been trained on before. Called down to the ground, said, oh, we haven't seen this one either. <laughs> And they said, well, you're okay for the short term, uh, just be ready to, put we had a backup system for the uh, removal of high carbon dioxide, it's just that the backup system would not let us go to full mission duration. So we started into using the backup system, uh, they said, we're going to get to work to this, down on the ground, they got very busy, put the best people on it, put a Tiger team together, and 72 hours later, they had a, f had a fix. We could go off our backup system. The fix itself was extremely simple. Uh, there's some images we took after we did it. Just move a few hoses around and some hose clamps, kind of like working on your car. Very, very easy. But what was going on down on the ground is a great model of a very similar process that happened during Apollo 13. Uh, the persistence to go troubleshoot uh, a challenge that they had never seen before, come up with an answer quickly under a certain amount of pressure. And I always found it quite interesting that the senior person on that life support team that came up with that solution had been a young engineer at NASA when Apollo 13 happened. So he had definitely had cut his teeth in uh, some very challenging situations. Uh, it brought to my mind the value of something that I call operational innovation or ops innovation. It's not the kind of uh, super creative people hanging around a studio coming up with incredibly artistic kind of creative ideas. That's not the innovation I'm talking about here. It's the kind of innovation that needs to be applied in your industry, needs to be applied in my industry, where people who are out on the job, who day to day do things, get a little idea one day. Says, hey, it would be a little smoother, a better 
flow to the operation if we make this one very tiny little change here. They run through the processes, of course, and they, they submit the inputs, and then over a period of time, the culmination, the sum of all those thousands of inputs comes up with new and innovative ways of doing business. And it's, in my view, every bit as innovative as the, as the sole creative genius in the workshop sculpting or whatever. It's just a different process to get to it. And I think as leaders, we need to encourage that. We need to constantly push people to look at everything they do, apply the, that situational awareness which you're going to help build within them to look at better ways of doing things. So my second uh, sort of uh, case study is a company I work with out in California called Xcore Aerospace. They're leaders in developing uh, very new technologies for, uh, for space, for propulsion specifically, tanks and pumps and uh, nozzles and, and whole engines. And my role has been with them partially on the business development side, but also the fun side is I've test flown the two technology development aircraft that we've flown. And now we're designing and, and have actually started building a suborbital space plane. So we intend to compete in this space. It's just magnificent to work with them. And uh, again, they're a great example, uh, just like the X Prize was a great example of purpose. They're a great example of program and applying these principles because we're a, a small company, fairly resource constrained, yet we've accomplished some amazing things and an amazing intellectual property portfolio. And what you're looking at here is some of, kind of a culmination of the, the rocket, the, our second rocket plane project, where we flew this vehicle, which was a prototype racing airplane for a commercial customer that wanted to race rocket-powered airplanes. Uh, we flew it at a huge air show in the States called Oshkosh. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a big aviation bus in front of about 100,000 people. And this is a company of only 50 people that invented all this technology, integrated it, developed the flight test for it, and uh, my role is, I love my role with the company, bringing the flight test culture and disciplines it, to play with all of these brilliant rocket engineers. And uh, I don't call them rocket scientists, we call them, they call themselves rocket engineers. They say, you're not a rocket scientist until you blow one up, and we've not blown any up, so we're still rocket engineers. You know. But it was just spectacular, uh, obviously great fun. Uh, as a guy that's uh, on the plus side of 50 to hop in little rocket planes and go fly and, and follow that first love of mine with the flying. But what is even more gratifying to me is working with a team that really gets it that on every level of our operations and really appreciates my inputs as well and helping build this new thing, um, not just to hardware, but a new approach to a, a uh, way of going to space. So it's, it's great fun, great way to wrap up this emphasis on program. And for my last few minutes, I just want to hit a couple highlights on people and perspective, and we'll wrap it up and, and have a few questions. I think of a group of people, a team, as a matrix. Uh, conceptually, I did not come up with this all on my own. My first commander, who was a great leader and a wonderful mentor for me, John Blaha, pulled me aside after work one day, and as part of his, you know, my apprenticeship really to be an eventual shuttle commander, he said, what Rick, what do you think my job is? And I said, well, John, your job's life support systems and the computers. You'll land Columbia when we come home, all the technical stuff. And he said, well, all that's true, but my real job is to work the matrix, to build this seven-person crew, the seven-by-seven seven set of relationships, to strengthen those, to build the cohesion so that when we collectively got to orbit, when the uh, oddball stuff came up, which it always does, we would deal with those anomalies and work very effectively together as a group. And when I got to orbit, I saw exactly what he was talking about. As a rookie before going there, I didn't realize how, um, how challenging it really is operating in that environment and how it takes a crew at that level of cohesion to really get the job done in the timelines that they give you. So I definitely took that philosophy and approach on board. I've expanded it since to think that any leader in any situation, and I categorize every single one of you as leaders, you're influencing for the good within your organization, specifically in the HSE field. But any leader exercising that influence needs to look at all the relationships of people he works with and all of the teams outside your immediate vicinity, whether it's up the chain within your own company or coming to conferences like this, looking at networking with others and how may I help them and how can we help one another move forward. I think it's a very powerful con uh, conceptual way of looking at those around you in a very positive sort of way. Uh, the other element of that, I'll just share a story uh, quickly about Kennedy Space Center. Um, you know, it's a big hardware place, and, and there's huge hardware there. This, this building, the assembly building that you see on the image on the left, 
uh, at, at one time was the largest building volume-wise in the, in the world. It's been eclipsed since. Uh, that American flag on the side is about the size of a, of a soccer pitch, you know, real football. I'm a, I'm a huge soccer fan, by the way, I just, on a side, nothing to do with the talk, but I just found out that there's a channel in the U.S. at 24-7 soccer, uh, soccer, the Fox Soccer Channel. So I've been watching Chelsea play football club Copenhagen recently, and I, I'm just loving it because uh, I get tired of American football at the end of the season, want to change. So anyway, nothing to do with the talk, just was a stray thought I was thinking about. So let's get back to business here. In the upper right-hand corner, you see the original seven astronauts, and uh, I had a chance to meet one of them. I've met several of them since, but Deke Slayton, just a few weeks after I joined the astronaut corps, and Deke was, he was the most people-oriented of all the original astronauts, and he did, he went out of his way at this event I was at, it was actually the astronaut reunion, and everyone's doing what you do at any reunion. They're talking with old classmates and friends, you know, people you'd walked on the moon with, although that's probably the only reunion where you could do that. But everyone's doing that, except for Deke. He and his wife were going around intentionally meeting all of the new rookies and just welcoming them, welcoming them and telling them how much uh, they were going to contribute to the program. And it was just a marvelous experience for me. A few years later, I had the chance to try to pay it forward a little bit, and I, I tried to be sensitive to opportunities to use the influence that comes with this blue astronaut suit in positive ways with the people that really make the program run, that, that uh, you know, the thousands of people that make this incredible venture work. And I was down at the Cape again back in the, um, the VAB for some other project and just was getting ready to head home. It was late second shift, so at about 5 or 6 in the afternoon, and I said, I'm going to go by one of the shops and just, uh, you know, see if there's anyone to visit with. And I looked in the window of one of the shops down uh, on the first floor there, and I saw a bunch of sewing machines. I thought, wow, that's really strange. What are the sewing machines doing here? Open the door. Is anyone home? And this little voice from the back, this little old lady said, yes, I'm, come on back. So I went back and talked to a seamstress, literally, who had worked in the space program uh, for th some 30 years and she had worked on soft goods the whole time, but she sewed together the thermal blankets that go on the top of the space shuttle. And we had a wonderful conversation. I thanked her for her work. And, and at the end, uh, I, and she said, uh, you know, she told me about her grandchildren. I told her about my children and how grateful I am that she did a good job with her work, those kinds of, of interactions. But at the end, she really touched me when she said, you know, I've worked out here 30 years, and I've never met an astronaut before. I said, oh, thank goodness I've just had the urge or felt like I should come by and talk to someone. So I like to think that I um, helped pay Deke's approach forward just a little bit and in turn had a wonderfully rewarding and gratifying experience myself. Do we have opportunities to do similar things in our companies? Absolutely. Now, whether you're getting out to the rigs on a regular basis or more involved on shore or whatever, just the interactions you have with others, the uh, building them up, the, the human side of the equation, equation, although can be very intangible, is hugely important in this entire process. Well, getting close to the end, need to uh, wrap up in the next couple of minutes. So we'll start with, uh, or we'll finish the people section with what I believe is the absolute most important quality any leader can have, and that is trustworthiness, the worthiness underlined. You know, for, uh, I, I think Carlene would agree with me that a, a key component for any high reliability organization is trust, is a high level of trust. Well, I believe, and that if that's a first order requirement, I believe a zero authority requirement uh, comes at the individual level with decisions throughout the organization to be trustworthy. And as a leader, it's absolutely mandatory. You know, when we go fly in space, when we do this scene that you see here where we fly down to Kennedy Space Center a couple days before launch, we're literally on the cusp of trusting our lives to one another. And I, I speak to many audiences where the people in their business don't trust their lives to one another. It's a, it's a joy to actually speak to a, an industry where the people out there on the rigs right now are literally trusting their lives to one another. And the underpinning for all that, at the end of the day, I believe, is the trustworthiness. Well, uh, real quick on perspective, I'm going to offer to you what I call my three ops. The first is, uh, is optics, like take the long-range view. Look at what can be accomplished over a long period of time. A great metaphor for that is the Hubble Space Telescope. You know, it gathers in light that has traveled for 13 billion years just to get to its collector sensors and then creates these incredible scientific results and beautiful pictures and so forth. Uh, the next is opportunities. They're all around. They're everywhere. On orbit, we get 16 sunrises and sunsets a day. 
And uh, in my view, that's kind of similar to the opportunities you get to influence for the good every day. You may not get 16, but uh, they're very fleeting and quick, but they're there. And you need to be sensitive to them and, and have the perspective that they're out there, that I can make a difference today with those. Uh, it's very similar to what uh, Brian Binney, who was the test flight on, on the second flight of Spaceship One, went to space, got back down, and he said, you know, I, his first thing that he said to the press was, I thank God I live in a place where something like this is possible. He pointed at this little wild little spaceship behind him. And it's having this attitude and perspective that opportunities are out there. We just need to capitalize on them. Uh, the third op, of course, would be optimism. I am not by nature a really optimistic person, nor have I been in a, a career field that's particularly optimistic. You don't send a test pilot out to an airplane and expect him to come back and say, oh, it's all wonderful. You know, you want him to figure out what's wrong so that you can fix it. However, I don't believe there's any dichotomy or paradox between that kind of approach, which you absolutely must take in your business to, to root out the challenges and find the opportunities for improvement. There's absolutely no diff, uh, paradox between that and still having a very positive overall out attitude that we can move forward, we can make a difference, we can seek after what I call the golden linings, which I believe are even better than silver linings. Silver linings is the kind of blithely going through life like everything's going to be okay. Golden linings is like, okay, we're going to have some challenges ahead of us, but we can overcome them. We've got to roll up our sleeves. We've got to do the hard work, but we can achieve our dreams, turn them into realities like Dr. Goddard uh, because we've got that positive, energetic spirit moving forward. Well, unfortunately, we are somewhat limited with our time here, um, so I'm going to wrap up with our final exam. This is a video that you're going to look, first view, very technical kind of view of the shuttle landing, and then it's going to cut to a video here in just a moment with a little bit of sound that I'll kind of talk around. My 15-year-old daughter, 15 at the time, 28 and mother now, Wow. Look how excited they are. Yep. Hi. 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 Very good. He's on Earth now. Good landing. They brought yes. us off on the test to minimize our head. Oh, wow. oh, wow. oh, wow. for, for tests, medical tests. Yeah. 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 My wife took the baby. Oh, yeah. Look at her. You cut your hair. Really. <laughs> <laughs> the final exam I want you to do for about five seconds here is to think of the differences or contrasts between the very technical stuff that you do the, and the business metrics and all of those components and the very human side that you're involved with, even in a, a very, very technical industry, and how you're going to mesh those together. And also uh, complement that with thinking about the people that you go home to every day, your family, friends, those who are dearest to you, and particularly uh, those that the people offshore in the rigs that are really you know, facing, that are potentially in the line of fire, that uh, they have the opportunity to go home to those loved ones as well. So last uh, two slides, I want you to first of all take a look at uh, what I believe may be the best uh, photograph from space of Scandinavia ever taken. It's, uh, uh, you know, with the orbits of the space shuttle, most of them are much farther south than northern Europe, and then you combine that with weather that's often overcast. It's difficult to get really good imagery of this part of the world, but here's a spectacular view. It shows a little bit of Germany and then, of course, uh, all of Denmark and a little bit of Sweden on the side and Norway up there, and, um, and here we are in a, a town on the uh, west coast of, of Denmark, a few hundred of us uh, in a very large world with, you know, many, many millions of people uh, in, in Europe, uh, billions of people across the planet, and we sometimes, in our moments of discouragement, think that, you know, what difference can I really make as one individual, and we kind of ground, grind it out or slog it out day to day, but I've been so blessed in my own life to see the power of individuals and uh, their ability to affect uh, important, global, substantive change for the better, and I think that's a process and a thing that very globally, again, is going on in your industry now, and you have the opportunity to make those global effects and to make a difference uh, literally around the world. And I wish you all the very best success in that. I thank you again for the opportunity to come share some of my thoughts with you on leadership and teamwork as it ties into uh, making things better and safer uh, in your industry. So uh, have a great 
rest of the uh, rest of the conference. Unfortunately, I have to head right out to catch a flight. I've got a talk in London tomorrow night, so I have to need to get over to the UK. But thanks again for the opportunity, and I think, Ann, we do have a few minutes to do some questions and answers. So, great. Thanks a lot. <laughs>